So that's just the pelvis, but the lower limb, you can divide it into two functional components. The skeleton of the lower limb may be divided into two functional components. Number one, what's called the pelvic girdle, shown on right there. And two, basically bones of the free lower limb, your thigh and your leg. So what you see there is the pelvic girdle. And I touched, well, let me kind of say what the pelvic girdle is. <coughs> pelvic girdle, sometimes called the bony pelvis, Pelvis is just a word in anatomy that means bowl. This is kind of like your waist, your hips. We call it the bony pelvis or pelvic girdle. It's a bony ring composed of the sacrum and two hip bones, the right one and the left one. Bony ring composed of the sacrum, which you know from the vertebral column and right, left, hip bones. Now the hip bones, we haven't talked about yet, but what you can see on this picture is that they're joined anteriorly at a joint called the pubic symphysis that are highlighted green. Two hip bones are joined anteriorly at the pubic symphysis. That's, a, that's the name of the joint. It's a cartilaginous joint. <clears throat> the two hip bones are connected posteriorly at the sacrum. Join posteriorly at the sacrum. Well, those are joints too. I mean, uh, those are sacroiliac joints. I've mentioned that before. So um, to be technical, the pelvic girdle doesn't include the sacrum, okay? When people say pelvic girdle, they just usually refer to the two hip bones. But I've noticed that when people say bony pelvis, 
they kind of consider the sacrum. So the sacrum is common to the pelvis as well as the vertebral column. You should probably remember that. Sacrum is common to the pelvis and vertebral column. So that's the pelvis. Let me show you what's meant by bones in the lower limb. People know what that is. You can see it on the skeleton bones and the thighs and the legs, includes the hip bone. So let me uh, reset and up the connective tissue. Let me just go lower limb on one side and isolate it. There you go. That's, that's it. That's the arrangement of the bones of the lower limb. And so when we talk about the lower, lower limb, we've got to talk about the weight-bearing function of it. We don't talk about that for the upper limb. We don't walk on our hands. We walk on our feet. So um, arrangement of lower limb bones is so that body weight is transferred from the vertebral column to the pelvic girdle, to the hip joint, to the femurs. I'll just say body weight transferred from vertebral column to the pelvic girdle to the hip joints. to the femurs on down. The femurs are the bone of your thighs, but I'll stop there. We basically get the idea. I mean, weight has to be transferred to your lower limbs. <clears throat> and so, the basic arrangement of these bones going from top to bottom Basically, the hip. The bone of the hip is the hip bone. It goes by different names. If you see the term coxal bone or os coxa, you know, I've seen that term too. Um, older books used to call it the anominate bone. means the bone with no name. It has a name. It's just when an anatomist uh, first looked at it, they tried to um, name it for what it looks like. It doesn't look like anything. So they just called it the nameless bone. But we just I mostly just call it the hip bone. Okay. Uh, the next major part of the lower limb is the thigh, then the leg, then the foot. Thigh leg, foot, the major regions of the lower limb. The thigh bone is the femur. It's the largest, strongest bone of the body. Okay, It's like the arm of the upper limb. You got one bone in the upper limb for the arm. What bone, is, what's the one bone? The humerus. The humerus, and it's the femur for the lower limb. The leg has two bones, like the forearm does, um, has two bones, and the leg is the tibia fibula. Now the tibia is the weight-bearing bone. 
Okay. It's, it's It's the one medial, okay? The fibula is lateral to it. It's like a splint. Um, they call it a splint bone. They call it the tibia. A, a, your, it's like your shin, your shin bone, basically. And they have bones of the foot. And there, there's many bones of the foot. There's tarsals. There's seven of them. We'll go through them. They're like the carpal bones. Um, that make up the ankle. And then you have meta, metatarsals, and then, you know, phalanges, digits of the toes. You have five metatarsals that connect to five toes or digits. So you have 14 phalanges, just, have, just like you had 14 phalanges in the digits of your fingers. Fingers and toes are both called digits. Okay. So that's the basic arrangement of the lower limb. Um, because we're quadrupeds, uh, well, we're not quad, we're bipeds. Because quadrupeds walk on all fours and bipeds don't, the femur has a little bit of an angle. It's hard to see. So pretend like the pelvis, which is the widest part of your hip, from point to point, the femur kind of angles in a little bit. And it goes down to your legs. Okay, that, that little angle. And imagine um, your bilateral and the force of your weight pushing down, force of gravity pulling down on you, right down the middle. Um, because we're bipeds, it's good to have this femur angle. Because when you lift one leg up during walking, the angle kind of centers your body weight more so you don't topple over. Also, I'll call it the femoral angle. It's actually been measured. It's called the Q angle. but I just want you to know basically, moral angle recenters body weight. During walking, an animal that's a quadruped. Basically, the limbs are more straight up and down. There's no angle. They don't need one. Because, well, they have two other limbs that'll keep the center of gravity, okay? So, quadrupeds, different. No, no, no for more angle. No, femoral angle. So, because we walk, we kind of need that femoral angle. Um, that's the basic idea of what we need our lower limbs for to walk. And um, I want to look at the bones in detail. I want to start with the pelvic girdle and look at the bone in the hip first. There we go. When you study this in the lab, the first thing you should um, orient yourself with is lateral versus medial. Okay, lateral versus medial. Because laterally, you see that big socket. Let me make it so big you can't not know what I'm talking about with that. That's the hip joint. That's the socket for the hip joint. So let's talk about the hip bone first.
Laterally, you see that deep socket. It's called the acetabulum, which is a word that means wine glass. Laterally, the acetabulum can be seen. It's a deep, it's a deep socket that basically receives head of femur. That's the hip joint, the head of femur in that socket. The deep socket receives head of femur. You can imagine what the head of femur must look like to fit that shape. Basically a round ball, okay, or most of them round ball, but we'll get to the femur. So um, first thing I want to mention is that this hip bone is actually three bones um, and they unite at the acetabulum. Let me pull back on that lateral view. is three bones and they're basically united at the acetabulum. I should say are three bones. Well, let me just tell you what the three bones are. It's the ilium, ischium, pubis. Ilium, ischium, pubis. <clears throat> Show them to you real quick. See that top part? It's like a fan. That's the ilium. Okay. Part, part of it's like a fan. So that's superior. This is a lateral view. So let me see if you're oriented. Is that when I highlighted green? Is that anterior or posterior? That is posterior. So that's posterior inferior. That's the ischium. It's kind of posterior inferior part of the hip bone. Anteriorly, you have this bone here, kind of like a sideways V. That's the pubis. Remember the name of the joint where these the two pubic bones connect? Pubic symphysis, same, same thing. Okay. Well, you know where you get pubic hair in that genital region? That's why they named the bone that. The pubic bone named for where you get pubic hair when you go through puberty. Okay, so uh, let me draw what's called the triradiate cartilage. So basically, before puberty, these three bones in this kind of Y-shaped area, the bones are not ossified. They're filled with this Y-shaped cartilage. Um, before. The three bones. Fuse, there is a tri radiate cartilage. Shaped like a Y. I'm trying to pencil it in there. You got to get a picture of it. I've got the atlas out. <coughs> Let's see if it runs. Ah, yeah, page 229 is a good picture of this. Tri radiate cartilage of the hip bone. Tri radiate cartilage of the 
if Ben would get up page 229 in the Atlas. If you're still like, I don't have the atlas, just go get it. Just buy it. I'm, I'm through waiting for you to get your books. Get the atlas. It's April. <laughs> I don't have my books yet. I'll tell you a little story. I hate to digress. I went to UC Davis and I was hanging out in one of these study halls and I just happened to overhear these girls talking about, oh yeah, I gotta study for my midterm. Oh, when is it? In two hours. <laughs> I just bought the book. I was like thinking, oh. that, that wasn't me, <laughs> okay? But there are students who are like that. I'll buy the book two hours before the test. Don't be that person, okay? If it's April and you, have, you haven't bought your book yet, don't let me know about it. <laughs> Am I trying to judge you? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. You pay too much money for college. You gotta get with it. I was on a, I was a science Olympiad coach. One of the mothers, she was a loan officer for this student loan company. She went after people who didn't pay back their student loans. She'd be like, these people like working at like, you know, Walmart and Starbucks, all these places, but they have to call, they couldn't finish college. But they have all these loans. It's like if you take out a loan, you should finish college and get a professional job. It's not worth it. Okay, and this kind of behavior I'm talking about, you don't buy your books, you don't come to class. You're not gonna graduate and then you spend all that money for nothing, you still gotta pay back the loans, that's not good. We don't want you to be in that category. I really encourage you to finish. It's hard to finish a class. <clears throat> okay, I'm getting back on track. I wanna go over the details of the three bones of the hip, ilium, ischium, pubis. And you know acetabulum, you know the hip joint, okay, that's the lateral view. I usually start with um, another feature called the obturator foramen. See that big hole? That's the obturator foramen. That's still another feature where all three hip bones unite, and you can see it. Now in life, that hole is filled with a membrane called the obturator membrane. And that membrane provides a nice attachment point for muscles. Let me show that to you. So see that membrane that fills the hole? That's the obturator membrane. And there are two muscles that attach there called the obturator internus, obturator externus. <coughs> Let me see if I can do a multi-selection, hold on. side, get the other one. Yes. Isolate. So we got the hip bone. See those two muscles attached on one on the inside, one on the other side. Those are called obturator internus and externus. So we'll get to those muscles. For now, just note the obturator membrane.
Okay, exit. And boom, let me get rid of that. All the connective tissues, turn all the muscles off. We'll go back to just the stripped down hip bone. All right, so we've got acetabulum, we've got obturator, foramen, and the membrane. That's just the ilium right there. Let's go over parts and surfaces. And I'll just kind of go through only the study uh, surface features that are on your study list. What I highlighted in purple is the crest of the iliac bone. So that's one surface feature. Be able to identify the act crest, basically a rainbow from front to back. I could still have you just identify, I could just say name, bone, <laughs> identify. And you have to, you would just say hip bone and you would say right or left. Do you think you were good at right or left for the first, the first test? Some of you were, some of you were not. So this is a chance for you to redeem yourself. Could you tell the right one from the left one in terms of hip bone? Which one's that? Right. That is the right. Okay, so the right track. And some of you develop that skill in lab, get good at telling right from left. But when I ask the question, identify bone. But remember, if I just ask you to identify a surface feature, I don't expect you to put right or left. I just want you to remember the surface feature. Okay. So when you put your hands on your hips, you're basically putting it on this. It's kind of at that level. It's the superiormost part of the pelvis. Um, there's the anterior superior iliac spine. I'm going to tap it right there, that little purple point anterior. Here, here's a sideways view. That's lateral. That's medial. So it's, it's that little spine, that bump right in the front. You can palpate it. That bony part of your hip right there. Palpate it is right now. Just get a, get a sense. Because notice it's right in the front. It's in the frontal plane. Okay anterior, superior, iliac spine. Abbreviated ASIS to help you to remember the order of the words, but you have to write it out for the test. Anterior, superior, iliac spine. It's, it's an attachment point. Um, there's some muscles that attach there. The sartorius, and as well as tensor fascia lata, those muscles attached there. We'll get to those muscles. There's also a ligament that attaches there. I know you haven't studied this yet, maybe. But these are muscles, OK? Let me give you one ligament that attaches here. It's called the inguinal ligament. That, that attaches to the spine. In anatomy, inguin means groin. So it's basically that area of the body. 
and the inguinal ligament runs from ASIS to the pubic tubercle. Let me show you pubic tubercle. Well, let me show you the ligament. Just get the ligament in there. There is a ligament. I'm going to isolate it. I'm going to show you from the side view. Right there, that's the inguinal ligament. Do you see how it's perfectly straight up and down? So ASIS and the pubic tubercle with the ligament in between, that's pretty much the anatomical position of the pelvis when you're standing. Right? Those two points, ASIS, anterior supraorbital ax spine, pubic tubercle, are in the same frontal plane. Okay? That's the anatomical position. ASIS, pubic tubercle. are in the frontal plane in the anatomical position so we got ilium, iliac crest, ASIS, there's something posteriorly called the greater sciatic notch, let me show you that Highlight the notch in purple, right there. So posteriorly, there's that big notch, the greater sciatic notch. Continue up here. So the word sciatic, it's always posterior. There's a big nerve that kind of passes by the notch. I can show that to you real quick. You should know the sciatic nerve for this unit. Throwing nerves. See how the, that big yellow thing? Well, the big yellow thing is the sciatic nerve. It's the largest nerve of the body. It's about the width of your thumb. Okay, that's how big that nerve is, and passing by the sciatic notch there. Um, So sciatic nerve passing by the greater sciatic notch. Uh, next structure, I want to show you the medial aspect of the ilium, something called the arcuate line. Let me go to parts and surfaces. There, what I highlighted in purple, part of the ilium, this is the medial aspect. It's called the arcuate line. Um, you, you can see it without the purple line there. So when you look at the bone, look for it. It's continuous with this pectin pubis line here. There's a line going from posterior to anterior. But we're talking about the ilium, since so it's only from here to here. Note the arcuate line. It's, it's a boundary. It's part of what's called the pelvic brim. pelvic brim or pelvic inlet. Because we need to start to think about the pelvis. You need to get into the pelvis. You need to get out of the pelvis. Let me go back to my pelvic view just to show you what I mean by pelvic inlet.
So what I'll do is I'll trace arcuate line pretty much right there and right there. You know, let me let me do 3D, not 2D. I'm going to just trace the whole pelvic brim. The arcuate line is part of it. There's arcuate line there, but I'm just going to trace the whole thing. From front, there's pubic symphysis, go around back, go all the way around, include the sacrum. Basically, that's it. That's pelvic brim or pelvic inlet. Okay. So if there's an inlet, there's an outlet. We know that too. No pelvic inlet or pelvic brim. No pelvic outlet as well. Pretty much above the pelvic brim is what's considered the false pelvis. Below that pelvic brim line is um, pretty much the true pelvis. Okay, um, let's see. All right, so let me write that down. Above pelvic brim. It's a term called false pelvis. It's not really the pelvis above it. Below it is the true pelvis or pelvic cavity. over here. Let me look at the inferior view here, and we'll draw the pelvic outlet. Okay. So here's my inlet. So here's the inferior aspect of the pelvis. I'll just kind of trace the outlet would be. Start there, I guess. not too bad. Um, you get the idea, right? That's the outlet. That's the inlet I tried to draw there. I put these up there to even better demonstrate. I mean, why do we need to know this? Basically, think about um, when you're born in the world, if you're born vaginally. Let's see. Okay, that's the male pelvis. So you were born through there. Uh, there's a female pelvis. Yeah, it's female. So basically, pretend that's your head and you just burst into the world. That's how you came through. Okay? I mean, you started out up here, right? Mm -hmm. Pushing out in the stomach, and then you come through here, um, the outlet. So that's an important question for obstetricians, is what we call these pelvic diameters, because you have to fit baby's head through during a vaginal birth. And um, so inlet to outlet, there's a couple of pelvic diameters I want to show you. There's good figures in your atlas. There's a whole section devoted to pelvis. It's the dark green tabs. And, um, pelvic. I'll give you two pelvic diameters to know. Yeah, page 233 is pretty good for the pelvic diameters.
So let's look, go to the inferior view. There's these two spines that point inwards, that point medially. They represent the narrowest point medially, from side to side. You, you can see them from up here. So, well, let me, just, let me draw a line between the two points from this view, maybe. I'll use 2D. From this point to that point, that line I drew horizontally is called the inner spinous um, diameter. This is the narrowest point of the pelvis um, from side to side, laterally. Narrowest diameter. Laterally. It's called interspinous because those two pointy things are actually called ischial spines. We'll, we'll get to that. Basically, this is the distance between ischial spines. I'm going to give you one more diameter to know. It's the narrowest space from front to back, anterior and posterior. Uh, so I'm going to go back. Let me just clear everything. Let me do multi select. Let me go like this. We're going to hide others. Let's look at the sacral pelvis sacrum hip bone from, uh, from a lateral view here. Okay, I'm going to take my pen and draw a line from there to there, basically. Should be a straight line. Line's a little crooked, but it's the distance, distance between the pubic symphysis and the sacral promontory, okay, which can be palpated. And you can kind of feel where the pubis is, and you can palpate that about 11 centimeters. This is, this is the pelvic diameter called the true conjugate, the narrowest diameter from anterior to posterior. True conjugate. Narrowest diameter. anterior to posterior. The distance, it's the distance between pubic symphysis, pubic symphysis and sacral promontory. That's a surface feature of the sacrum. You have to still know sacrum. Okay. All right, so all this I sprung off of teaching the arcuate line, remember, just to backtrack. I taught the arcuate lines. So I was like, well, I'm teaching that. Now I got to teach the pelvic brim. But now I got to teach the pelvic outlet. Now I got to teach true and false pelvis. Now I got to teach the pelvic diameters. The last thing I need to teach off this trajectory can you tell the difference between a male and female pelvis? <coughs> like these, I'll put them side by side on the test. Be like, well, which one's the whatever, the male or female? Let me, let me tell you some of the differences. And you can test yourself in the lab. Or over there on those guys or girls. <clears throat> G 
gender differences. There's gender differences um, because of childbearing. There are differences that have uh, that we can see the male and female pelvises. A male pelvis. Who do not um, bear, bear children. <coughs> and on this app, they, they do have that gender difference. Let me reset. That's a male pelvis. And, well, I mean, without the side by side, it's hard to tell. Let me just tell you. A male pelvis is more narrow and it's heavier. Bones are heavier. And again, there's, there's good gender differences on page 232 in the atlas. And um, let's see. Another thing I like to look at, it's the first thing I do. It's called the subpubic angle. Um, it's the angle right here. Okay. You can approximate it by taking your two fingers and going like this, okay? Like, well, I can't do it like that. And it's been measured something like uh, 70 degrees. It's more narrow. You expect it to be wider in a female to fit, accommodate baby's head. So a female pelvis, let me show you that. There's the female pelvis. It's a little wider and it's lighter. Wider, lighter, the subcubic angle is more like 90 to 100 degrees. Approximate it by taking thumb and index finger and going like that. That approximates that degrees, whereas males, it's these two fingers. Okay. So um, those are some basic gender differences. Can you tell a male from a female pelvis based on those characteristics? And let's get back to uh, the surface features of the iliac bone. I think I'm done. With the iliac bone, let me double check my list. When we left off on arcuate line, I'm going to go on to the is ischium. Little parts and surfaces. Okay, let me use surfaces. So the ischium is basically your sit bone. It's what you're sitting on. You don't really sit on your gluteal muscles. You sit on your ischium. Sometimes it's called your sit bone. That's what you're sitting on right now. And, um, well, the bumpy part of that bone that you sit on, the sit bone part of your sit bone, is called the ischial tuberosity, right there. What's in purple there is the ischial tuberosity. It's very roughened. So you know that as a surface feature. And you have to name this when I say identify bone left and right, right? It's, it's the ischium, yeah, it's not the, can't call it the sit bone. Um, but basically no ischial tuberosity. That's an important thing to know. Not only do you sit on it, it's um, the hamstrings attached there, your hamstring muscles.
not all of them. As a muscle group, most of them do, and we'll get to that. So that's an attachment point for that posterior thigh muscle group. The ischium, there's also that little spine that I just mentioned for the interspinous distance. It's in purple now. That's what it looks like when the hip bone is isolated. It's the ischial spine. So I already noted the interspinous distance. There's other things that are important. There's a, an important ligament that attaches there in the gluteal region. Let me show you. Sacrospinous ligament is the one I want to go for here. Let me turn it on. See that ligament? I'll highlight it in green. Going from the sacra to the spine, and that's an important one to know. For the gluteal region when we get there, so just note that uh, sacrospinous ligament attaches here. The last feature of the ischium is the ischial ramus. Ramus in anatomy means arm. It's a thin bar of bone. So if I'm tagging it on a test, maybe I'll put the sticker something like somewhere in like here, half of this bar. That's kind of where I would think the ischial, the ischial ramus is. I don't really want to say anything about it, just ischial ramus, okay? And then, to continue on with pubis, there's, if you look on your list, there's inferior ramus of pubis, there's superior ramus of pubis. Since I got this here, I'll do inferior ramus of pubis right next to it. So you can call it pubis, or your pubic bone. Uh, note the inferior <laughs> ramus of pubis. Okay, let me draw a box around it. I mean, pretty much, I guess, from there to like there. Maybe I'll put a, put the piece of tape somewhere in there. So if I put the piece of tape more anterior, I'm going for this ramus of the pubis, the inferior one. If I put it more posterior, I'm going for the ischial ramus. Right. Now, if I put the piece of tape up here, kind of more like that, that's the superior ramus of pubis. <laughs> So no, no, those three, ramus. Uh, so we'll go A, B, C on top there. So A, B, C. Okay, so that's kind of the order I did them. Uh, the, the last surface feature for a pubis is a pubic tubercle. Done. Clear. Go back to my surface feature app. Pretty much that little dot right there. Where I highlight it in purple, just look for a little bump right around there and call it pubic tubercle. That's where the inguinal ligament attaches. I already noted that pubic. Tuber coal. Okay, cool. Did, did everything. The inguinal ligament. The same one I listed before. So I did ilium, ischium, and pubis. Cool. So we can move on to the thigh now. Uh, thigh bone. 
There's the whole lower limb. So we can do femur right there. And pretty much the femoral head, which I have highlighted in green, in the acetabulum, that's the hip joint. So let's talk about the hip joint. You already wrote it, I'll write it again. The hip joint is femoral head and acetabulum. Now that's a very deep ball and socket joint. Let, let's kind of talk about the movements of the hip joint. The hip can rotate. It can, you can rotate medial or lateral. You can have medial or lateral rotation of the hip. If you don't want to say hip, you could say femur, the region of the body that's moving. Right? That's acceptable. It's the thigh. But let me show you that. We'll learn all the muscles that do it, but um, let me just give you one example. Throw in some muscles. That one should do it. lateral rotation. I don't know if you can see that subtle turning right there. Well, maybe it's better I just show you. So if, if I'm, I mean, watch my arm, I'm going to do what my leg is doing. When I turn my foot out, what is that? Which way? That's lateral rotation. So when I turn my foot back in, I'm rotating my hip medially. So that's the motion I want you to know. You can also abduct, adduct the hip, a deduction, or a deduction of the hip. That's in the frontal plane, right? Movement in the frontal plane. Let's see if that's here. So when you move the hip, the whole lower extremity moves, but the joint that's moving is the hip. So you can't say abduction of the leg because the knee's not moving, it's the hip, okay? So when you move it out, that's a deduction, and when you move it back in, a deduction. So you can have that movement, you can flex extend the hip, So when you move the hip posteriorly, that's extension. Let me show you flexion. There's a muscle that does it. When you move the hip forward and up, that's flexion of the hip. Okay, so look at the joint that's moving. Technically, I'm talking about the hip. But the knee's moving too. You're flexing the knee as you flex the hip, but I'm just talking about that. This moving forward is hip flexion. So no flexion, extension of the, let's see, is there anything else? Rotation, abduction. I think that's pretty much it for movements of the hip. Let's look at ligaments that stabilize the hip joint. There's three. So we're not doing all the ligaments, but the ones I want you to have. If I zoom in on that hip joint, what, what's keeping the head in there? Uh, well, actually, let's, let's include a fourth ligament. There, there's one, there's that head right there. 
Um, I think I isolated it. Let me. It's called ligament of the head. So what I've highlighted in green is the ligament of the head. It's literally called that. That helps stabilize the hip joint. So hip joint ligaments. Ligament of the head. And well, let me finish my thought of femur. Ligament of the head of femur. That's one kind of uh, ligament there I want you to know. Well, anyways, let's get out of here and go back. Okay, so if I turn on the first layer of connective tissue, that, that's the, um, the joint capsule. Okay, it's a synovial joint. You don't really have to know that. And there's other stuff that gets stacked on. Um, I want you to know this one. That joint is called the pubofemoral ligament. Now these ligaments are named for the bones that they attach to. That, that's an easy way to help you remember. If, you, if I, I don't remember the name of the ligament, but I remember, well that's Pubis, that's femur, then you got it. Pubofemoral. The largest one, laterally, is the iliofemoral. That one, let me isolate it, get the hand out of the way. That's ileal femoral. <clears throat> and then posterior, you have ischial femoral. So right there, going from the ischium to the femur, ischio femoral. So these three ligaments, if I do a multi-selection, now they wrap around the hip. The way they kind of spiral around, I don't know if you can envision this, but when the hip extends, they kind of wrap tighter around the hip. So the hip is more stable during, during extension because of the way these wrap around. Tighten during extension. So they loosen during flexion, basically. So the hip is a little less stable. Like, you know, when you do lunges and you lunge during working out, but when you flex, these don't, aren't as tight. Okay. A very famous um, sports medicine case, um, the athlete Bo Jackson, I'm kind of dating myself. We, while I was watching a football game, a playoff game, and he lunged forward fighting for yards. Now he is so strong that when he lunged forward and then came out of it, he pulled his socket out. <laughs> he dislocated. He actually uh, ruptured um, a small blood vessel there. And 
his femoral head necrosed, and he had to have a hip replacement. Now, he still came back from that and played professional foot baseball. But he, made, he was a football baseball player. Uh, I think one of the last great two-sport athletes. But anyways, I remember watching that game. He didn't do much. He just lunged. Okay, but when you have big, strong muscles, you can actually dislocate your own joints. And tear blood vessels and require hip, hip replacements. But anyways, those are those ligaments. I want you to know those. That's the hip. Let's move on down to the femur. Pretty much the whole proximal femur. They're heavy. I've seen them. It's like, I open the cadaver up, this one, and it's like, we don't know what's going to be in there because they don't give us the medical history. And it's, it's hard metal. It's heavy. You gain a lot of weight when you get these things replaced. I've seen replaced hips, replaced knees. Let's just look at the femur. There you go. Femur all by itself. Uh, when I'm in this room, I always show students my favorite femur. I'm going to go over and find it. Better still be there. <laughs> Every year I like to check on my favorite femur. It has the best adductor tubercle on it. Anyways, yeah. it's starting to degrade over time. Anyways, look how, look how long that thing is. It's got it's tall. This approximates, your femur length is about four times your height. Okay. Your height is four times your femur length. Yeah, I think I said that wrong. Your height four times the length of that bone. It's the longest, strongest bone of the body. It's the one bone of the thigh. Femur bone of the thigh, which is the region between hip and knee, right? And um, anyways, what I had said was the longest, strongest bone of the body, and its height is about four times femur length. All right, so the features, um, well, I've already mentioned the femoral head. Let me, let me go proximal to distal like I usually do. <laughs> What's in purple is the femoral head. It's about two thirds of a ball, right? Very ball shaped femoral head. Part of the hip joint, as we've already said, it's about two thirds of a sphere of a ball. That's its shape. Now, there's one feature of it. If you look at the top, there's a little divot, a little depression. See that depression? Well, that's the phobia. Okay, uh, phobia capitis is the full name. And well, that's where the ligament of the head was. It was in that little divot. Phobia. So the name of the of the structure is phobia capitis. Phobia means depression in anatomy. Okay. So capitis, you know, it's part of the head. This is where the ligament of the head of femur was. 
ligament um, head um, femur. It's pretty much in that little divot, that little depression. Okay, so you have that little foci capitis in the femoral head. It always goes head to neck. What's in purple is the femoral neck, which is prone to fracture. Okay, and um, typically a fracture of the femoral neck is a hip fracture. Femoral neck. There's a fracture of the femoral neck. That's my understanding. Now, you can fracture the actual hip bone. I just lectured on it. You can fracture your pelvis, but when people say hip fracture, they probably mean femoral neck. So this app has a fracture app. Fracture. So I'll just draw a jagged line through there. Just a fracture through there. Okay, do you do that? Um, jump off a 10 foot something and land. Uh, anyone ever jump out of a plane? Well, when you land, that, you've jumped out of a plane? I thought you raised your hand, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, when you land, you have to be careful not to, that force, okay, can uh, break your hip. So that is the femoral neck. You have trochanters, too. I'm going to reset this. Okay, so let me go surfaces, let me go that big purple knob is called the greater trochanter. That's the anterior view of the femur, and that is purple is the greater trochanter. There's a lot of muscles that attach there. Uh, we'll, we'll go through them. And I'll just list it there. I guess the confusing thing is not to confuse it with the lesser trochanter, which is more medial. So what's in purple now is the lesser trochanter. Basically, a lot of thigh muscles will attach here. We'll, we'll go through them. The trochanters are kind of like the tuberosities and the humerus. So you have trochanters. Uh, let's see what else you have on your list. There's a lot for femur. I'm looking at the femur. It's like you got like this many stuff to know. I don't know if you have it out now. And uh, the next thing I have is a posterior structure called the gluteal tuberosity. It's a, it's a rough line on the back, approximately. Just look for that. Let's go over surfaces. Try to highlight that line in purple. There you go. This is a posterior view. So posteriorly, um, purple doesn't show too well all the time. It's right there. That line is the gluteal tuberosity on the posterior aspect of the femur.
This is one of the insertions for gluteus maximus. It's one of them. There's others. So gluteus maximus is a big muscle of that region. We'll get to it. And um, yeah, just know that. Now the, uh, the gluteal tuberosity, it continues as a line here called the linea aspera. So this is a posterior aspect. I want to highlight linea aspera in purple. It shows up okay there, that line right in the middle. Linea aspera. It's a line, and there are two muscles um, that attach there. One is a big muscle called the ductor magnus. The other is a smaller muscle called the short head of biceps femoris. So know both of those. Let me write them down here. A ductor magnus attaches there as well as short head of the biceps. For Morris. <laughs> so the adductor magnus will insert there. For the biceps for Morris, the short head, it, it originates from there. Uh, see if I can show that to you real quick. Don't isolate those two muscles. Well, I mean, I think it's obvious. Let's see if you're awake this morning. I mean, which one's the magnus? <laughs> well, it's the one that's bigger. You know why they call it an adductor? It should make sense. Remember that rule I taught you? You can tell the action of a muscle based on how it attaches. It's pulling from the inside. If you pull in, isn't that adduction? So that whole muscle group, um, the, the reductors, okay? And that, that's the biggest one of the group. Short head of the biceps morse, we'll get to that. Hamstring muscle basically flex the knee. That's the short head of the biceps morse. There's a long head, I'll show it to you later. I just want you to show you the muscles that attach to the linea aspera. There's also, when we get down to the distal femur, there's popliteal surface. off muscles. Let me isolate femur, go back to my surfaces. What's in purple and the distal femur there, that's basically the back of the knee. It's popliteal surface. surface is just a surface. There's important things there. There's a major artery, nerve, and vein that go through there. Well, let's know the artery. Popliteal artery passes by there. So let me put it back in the skeleton there. Let me throw in arteries. So do you see an artery passing by the popliteal surface? That would be popliteal artery. It passes by here. thing you should know about this artery, this artery is in the back, but it came from the front, okay? So, let me kind of zoom back out. Let's follow this artery. I mean, the artery starts in your heart, right? And then it goes down to your abdomen, and it's got to get out of the, the, the body cavity, and it goes out the front there, 
it's going to go under the inguinal ligament. But anyways, we're in the front. And where it goes to the back, you can, you can see that, right? Where it goes to the back. And um, it's going to pass through the adductor magnus muscle. Let me throw that muscle back in there. So what I have highlighted is the adductor magnus muscle, and there's a little hole through, through that muscle, right? This little hole here. And that's where the artery passes through. Now the name of the artery, when it's in the front, is called the femoral artery. When it passes through this adductor hiatus, the name changes to the popliteal artery. Okay, so you should know that. Pretty important. Um, Popliteal artery is a continuation of the femoral artery. The femoral artery was anterior. When the femoral artery passes through the adductor hiatus, the name changes. When the femoral artery passes through a ductor hiatus, the name changes. popliteal artery. And that's an important anatomy feature I, I think you should know because this is a major artery. What if the major artery stayed on top of your kneecap? Do you think that's going to work out well for you? No. Every time you fall down, you might rupture it, right? It's, it's not good. So it's good that it's back there. It's for protection. Um, Okay, so that's popliteal surface. The next thing is the, I think it's the condyles. Let me check my list there. Yeah, we have medial lateral condyles. It's the classic knobby ends of a bone, those femoral condyles. I have them highlighted in green. Medial lateral femoral condyles. and lateral femoral condyles. So that's two structures, right? The medial and the lateral one. <clears throat> so I know we're all zoomed in, but I mean, I know that's the medial one. And on a picture like this, how do you orient yourself? Fibula is lateral. Okay, so that makes that medial, that's lateral. And uh, well, these basically articulate with medial lateral condyles of the tibia, right, of your knee. Articulate with medial lateral condyles of tibia. The main articulations of the knee joint. Yeah, so we're getting to the knee, but before I do knee, let's do the epicondyles. So I kind of need the surface features app of this thing here. Uh, let's kind of look. <coughs> We're going to go, we're going distal femur. That's the anterior aspect. This is the posterior aspect. 
that orange thing on the lateral aspect, that is the lateral epicondyle. You also have medial epicondyle on the sides. So note the epicondyles. Knee ligaments attached there. Well, I'll, I'll show you those um, in a bit. Epicondyles are good for that. So you got condyles, epicondyles, uh, a few more structures. There's the intercondylar notch, intercondylar notch. Well, that's simply the notch between the condyles. There's a space there, highlight in purple now, intercondylar notch, a notch between the condyles. I'm just going to list it, I'm not going to say anything about it. All I would say is what the name is. Intercondylar means between condyles. That's all you got to know. Uh, okay, I did intercondylar notch, condyles, epicondyles. There's patellar surface and a ductal tubercle. Let's go to the front. This is the back. Yeah. Yeah, fossa is okay. Sometimes it's called the intercondylar fossa. You can call it the notch if you want. That's the front. I'm going to orient you. That's the full femur length. This is the anterior aspect. In the anterior aspect, you can't see the condyles pretty much. But you can see the patellar surface from the anterior view. Patellar surface. Anterior. Pretty much that's where the kneecap sits on. Uh, the patella is on there. Anterior surface for the patella, which is basically your kneecap. Well, let me show you your kneecap. Let me put it back in the skeleton. So that's patella, your kneecap. That sits on the patellar surface of the femur. And um, one last surface feature is the adductor tubercle. See that little purple spot? It's kind of within the medial condyle, medial epicondyle, but the tendon of adductor magnus attaches to that little bump, making the bump. So note the adductor tubercle. Let me show you adductor magnus just one more time. throw the artery back in there. Sorry, I already mentioned it, but um, the structure I want you to know is a ductor tubercle. That tubercle is, is a little bump created by the tendon of a ductor magnus attaching there. Pretty much, when I say the tendon, this tendon right there, it attaches right there. There's a little bump on the inside 
right around here. And this is creating the adductor magnus, and that's the popliteal artery passing through there. Now the reason why the favorite femur is my favorite femur is it has the best example of a ductor tubercle. And it hasn't broken off yet. Yeah, I'll be really sad when this adductor tubercle wears down from student use, then it will no longer be my favorite femur. I'll have to demote it. I'll find another favorite femur. So don't mess up my favorite femur, please. Let's use our carpets and um, make sure your hands are clean when you touch the bones and the girl will be okay. Now let's take a break and we'll come back, we'll do the knee, the leg, and the foot. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sending my grade to the 